Uh oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm trying to say it looks like it's working pretty well here on Streamlabs OBS. There's a button for multi stream. What happens when I press that? It says stream chat read only. Uh, nothing showing up, so I'm going to go back to that YouTube one. I'm going to read, I guess I could read comments here. I mean, that's fine. It looks like it's working fine. Let me know how the sound is. On uh, Streamlabs OBS, it is showing all the comments from YouTube. It's not showing the comments from Entropy, but I can jump over here to Entropy. Uh, so it looks like it's going pretty well. Matt and I did a test stream earlier today. There is a learning curve for Streamlabs OBS, which is why I hadn't used it before. But um, it wasn't too bad. At first, I was a little intimidated because there was a bunch of new stuff. But... I figured out a couple of the kinks and, and now it seems to be going pretty well, pretty well. So good. I Hopefully we've solved that whole problem. Uh, simple Dan Forever says audio and video look good. That's good to hear. So it's a little hot right now. Well, C Ward says a little blurry. It's looking okay here. It might be your, uh, your let me look here. Let me check on, um, no, on YouTube, on my stream, this is what I get back. From there, it looks okay, so it might be yours. I don't know. Uh, I'm a little hot. It's kind of warm out. Uh, Matt doesn't like to turn on the air conditioning until it's getting into the 90s, but um, that's going to happen later this week. It's supposed to be 99 on Wednesday. But right now, yeah, I'm a little hot. I decided to put my hair down. I've been working really hard on the gardens outside. I decided not to give you uh, pictures of updates of the garden. I'm going to wait another week or two to see, you know, if there's a real difference. The, at the end of the show, as for the outro, I'll show you guys the little slideshow with music that I did last week that has a lot of the um, seedlings that we germinated from seeds. But I went back and I figured out how much time I've spent on the garden this spring. Now, this doesn't include germinating, but just on getting everything into the ground, preparing the ground, getting everything into the ground. It's been about two and a half weeks and I've been working really hard, uh, like long days out there. My hours for work are flexible because I work at home and I've been putting in a lot of hours out there. So I would say that normally if you are trying to put a garden in, you need to plan if, and you're trying to feed your it's not going to cover all of our calories, but if you were trying to do a, a significant supplement for your family's calories, you're going to want to spend probably four weeks out there getting your garden ready. So I think by the time I've got everything in the ground, it will have been about three weeks of rather intensive work. I try not to work in the hottest part of the day in the middle of the afternoon, but I uh, usually get out there and I work in the morning and sometimes in the evenings, just getting everything in the ground. And then we also spent significant time germinating seeds in the late winter and then acclimating our seedlings to the weather uh, in the late winter, early spring. This should to give everybody an idea um, of what it takes to really have a significant garden. And it should cover most of our vegetable needs over the summer. Uh, for calorie crops, it's only going to be a fraction of what, if we were trying to live off of that garden and our own animals, what I have in there now would probably only be a fraction of our calorie uh, needs. I think that if you're really trying to feed your whole family, then you're going to have to have at least two adults working really hard for four to six weeks just to get everything in the ground. Um, because it's just it's just a lot of work to get it in the ground. So that's what's going on with that. And part of the reason why I'm uh, talking about gardens so much is that the price of food is going up significantly. And I think I've learned a lot working on the gardens, both in New Hampshire and then when I came here. There is a lot of trial and error, a lot of things that you learn by doing. And if you're thinking you're going to learn everything from books, when you really need it, you're gonna you're gonna mess up. You're gonna you're not gonna have enough. Like um, just to give you an example, my peas aren't doing very good right now, and it's because I put them in too late. 
and I didn't realize I was putting them in too late, but I, you know, I asked Matt, he knows more about farming than I do. Why are my peas looking so sad? And he says, I just, I should have put them in earlier. They're not doing well in the heat right now. All right. So that is what's going on with that. Let me read some of the comments. I, uh, uh, Kyle Glenn says the stream is fine. And of course you're hot. Thank you very much. I'm starting to sweat already. Um, Alkman says, looks like entropy is lagging behind YouTube, but both are good. That always happens. There's always, they're never quite synchronized the same way. And sometimes it'll actually be entropy that's ahead of YouTube. So I don't know. I have, don't have a good explanation for it. Kyle Glenn says, interesting experience at Winn-Dixie today. Repeated the meme about how the aliens would say hello. Hell no about meeting Joe Biden. And she laughed and cussed him out. This is a cashier and she hates him. Elva Caro says, Laurel, look into lactobacillus fermentation. You'll find out we're missing out on a lot of good flavors without it. And it can be used for food preservation with just salt. Okay, good, good to know. I will see if I can take a look at that. Uh, also, my mother-in-law dropped off a lot of strawberries that she got from one of her clients. Rusness says Americans on average can afford to eat fewer calories. Yeah, that's true. I, I'm not going to deny that one. Um, and of course, we got 10. Well, right now we have 10 hens and two roosters. And um, we thought we had all hens. But then they got a little older and we realized, no, we've got a couple of roosters. We've actually already lost two chickens. I ended up plucking them. One was one of the chickens got attacked by a dog. And then uh, the other one was... Um, we had three roosters and we should not have three roosters with that many hens. So we culled one of the roosters. And I do not like to pluck chickens and prepare them, process them, take out all of their innards. I had a dry heave, not in the killing part. Matt did the killing. But, you know, when you're gutting the chicken, at some point you come into contact with chicken poop. And I just... I. It's nasty. I had a couple of dry heaps, but I did it. I did it and I got them all um, cooked and everything. Black Magic made it. He fucking made it. By the way, uh, Black Magic, you had asked me before if it's okay for you to hang out with my son. Absolutely. My son is still in New Hampshire, which is where Black Magic is. My son is a lot of fun and he's fun to hang out with. You are welcome to hang out with my son. Don't get him too drunk, okay? And if you do, he has to stay over. But other than that, it's fine. He lives very far away from you. Isaac lives in Nashua, in Europe, really far north, so I don't know about that. All right, enough about the gardens, but this is kind of related to that. So now working, this is a different, what, Restream was just a way to take the stream that I was sending from OBS and send it to multiple places. Using Streamlabs OBS, which is related to OBS, but isn't the same, it's it, the whole thing is different. I'm not just restreaming. I'm using a different platform to run the show. So that was a little intimidating. So just forgive me if I have a couple of kinks. I think it's going to be okay. But let's start with the first story that I have tonight, which is related to gardening. This is about California. California is having a major drought, which I have reported on in the past. And what California would like to do, the state legislators, don't, they're going to give a different reason for why they want to do this. The state legis of Cal legislators of California would like to take away the water rights of the farmers. They have a private water right, which they own. And um, they would like to use imminent domain to pay a pittance to these farmers. If they're gonna, it's $1.5 billion, but that's not what it's worth. They're going to pay a pittance to these farmers to take back their water rights. And it's not going to be voluntary. It's going to be imminent domain. And the excuse that the state legislature is giving is that they're trying to save the salmon industry in California. They're trying to save these salmon. I think the real reason is they want to divert, divert the water to the voters to um, the large population of people throughout California because they don't have enough water. There's always a competition in California whenever it gets to the dry season. There's a competition between the farmers and the residents. The reason this is significant for everybody else is because a third of our vegetables for the United States, a third of our vegetables come from California and two thirds of our fruit. 
and I think also two thirds of our nuts. California is a major, major produce producer. It produces a, in total about a third of our produce for the entire country. If California, if the California state legislature takes away the water rights of the farmers, that will significantly worsen the food crisis in the United States. By leaps and bounds, it will be very, very bad. I'm not sure when they intend to take away the water rights of these farmers, whether they're gonna do it this year or next year. But it'll be bad either way. It's just a matter of are we going to intensify this crisis now or later. Uh, I, I see that Mary Smith is like, California salmon? Yeah, but they want to save the California salmon industry. We have a thriving salmon industry in Alaska and in some other places. We can live without the California salmon industry. We cannot live without California's fruits and vegetables. We need those fruits and vegetables and they're getting ready to take away their water, water rights. When it, once again, they're going to say that it's because they want to save the environment. Once they take away those water rights, like they're gone. And then they can use it, uh, divert the water to the cities whenever they choose. They being the state legislature. That new $1.5 billion proposal in the state legislature would see the government buy back senior water rights with the intention of saving local fish and wildlife. Buy back. It'll be eminent domain and they'll give them a fraction of what it's worth. But some say there's other ways to save water. This is give a little to save a lot. Because once we lose species, they're gone. We can never get them back. John McManus of Golden State Salmon believes these buybacks can help aid the resurgence of salmon, a $900 million industry annually in California. The salmon industry in California is one of those rare industries that actually relies on a natural product that needs to be sustainably managed. Proponents believe this is a chance to save critical species and incentivize the sale of the land. This is really a plan that's kind of aiming in that direction of, of having people and farms on the landscape simultaneously in a more sustainable way. But some are skeptical. Those are private water rights that are owned by farmers. And uh, if we don't have water, we're not going to have food. And so you're not a willing seller until they take your water away from you and you can't make a living on your land. And believe there are other options. We're, we're buying farmland to retire it and use that water for environmental purposes. He's saying straight up, yeah, we're going to kill the farms. We don't want these farms in California. He, he just, she just said it outright. And we have other options. State Senator Brian Dolly believes water storage can help the state through droughts that lead to these debates. We have $97 billion in surplus here in the capital and we're not putting money towards building reservoirs. Many potential answers to a million dollar question. How can we harmonize 40 million people on the landscape with very sensitive ecosystems that have specific environmental needs? You can't. You shouldn't be putting that many people on the landscape. It's it, immigration is a big part of this. And I think that's one of the facts that have to be faced. Yeah, Rick Board is saying retire the farmland. Listen, um, there's a lot of other places in the US where the fruits and vegetables, well, the vegetables will grow well. Uh, it depends on the fruit. Some fruits will go grow well in a lot of other zones. Um, there are some fruits that uh, it, it needs to be really, really warm. And your other option is probably going to be Florida. And Florida already grows a lot. So I don't know how much of the warm weather fruits can be grown in Florida. But even if uh, other parts of the country sort of pick up the slack, for California not doing as much farming, that's not a process that happens overnight. Uh, a lot of the farmland is being used for other things right now. So it would have to no longer be used for other things. And then there's farmland uh, in other parts of the country that has been converted back into forest that would need to be cleared if it were to be used for farmland again. Uh, much of New England is previously farmland, but the forest has been allowed to come back. That's not a process that happens overnight. That is a lot of work. So I don't know uh, if we were to transition farmland out of California, that, that is a process that it, it didn't get there overnight. It's not gonna come back overnight. It, that is a, has to be a very intentional 
slow process to move everything back to other parts of the country. And I think that there are some fruits and vegetables that we're right now getting in the middle of the winter that we wouldn't be able to get in the middle of the winter anymore. We've sort of gotten used to having fresh strawberries available in December or January. That's not going to happen anymore if we lose a major fruit producer in a warm area. So I think what the politicians in California are talking about is extremely foolish will be very, very bad for, certainly for the United States, but also for a lot of the world. There are already, as we previously discussed, really bad food crises happening in other places. Uh, we'd mentioned before that there are certain parts of the world where the food crisis is going to hit hardest very early on. That is currently already happening in the Sahel, the Sahel region of Africa, as expected, places like Chad and Niger are already experiencing very serious food crises. Chad has declared a food emergency. Chad's transitional government has declared a food and nutrition emergency in the wake of the Ukraine war and a poor harvest in neighboring Niger and much of the African continent. Food insecurity is skyrocketing, basically, as expected. I think I wasn't the only one who predicted this would happen. I think a lot of people did. Last week, Chad declared a food emergency due to lack of grain supplies. The landlocked African nation on Thursday urged the international community to help its population cope with rising food insecurity. Cereal prices across Africa surged because of the slump in exports from Ukraine, a consequence of the war in Ukraine and a raft of international sanctions in Russia, which have disrupted supplies of fertilizer, wheat, and other commodities from both Russia and Ukraine. DW spoke with one couple in Chad who are dealing with the effects of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm not going to say these people's names. They're too long. Tortala and Non Aswam, I guess I am going to say their names, live in a neighborhood of Chad's capital. Um, the woman, Anne, oh, her first name is Anne. That's an easy one. Anne, who just returned from the market, expressed her dissatisfaction with rising food prices. Look what I bought. Here is meat for 1,500 francs, rice for 1,000, and spices for 600. That's more than 3,000 francs for lunch for four people. She told DW that in the past, the same purchase would have cost 2,000 francs. My husband and I spend 60,000 francs a month on food, but now even 90,000 is not enough. This is the, uh, if you're looking at the map right now, this is the Sahel region. And these are the parts of Africa that right now are being hit really, really hard with this food insecurity that's happening. <laughs> Rizna says, you must pronounce the funny names. These are the parts of Africa that right now are being hit. And you might think, well, why the hell should I care about this part of Africa? Uh, and there's two reasons. One of them is this is just the beginning. We're going to see a lot more of this all around the world. We're seeing the most unstable, food unstable places get hit first, but it's not going to stay there. There's going to be a lot of the rest of the world that's going to become very, very food unstable. This is a harbinger of what's to come. And then the other reason this matters is because when those people don't have anything to eat, they're not going to stay there. They're going to try to go someplace else where maybe there's food and they will risk their lives because they have nothing else to lose and they're going to flood everywhere. There's a lot of people in that area. Nigeria is a very, very populous country. They are going to flood into Europe, into Asia, and they're going to make their way to Latin America and then join the migrant caravans to go up north. We have seen in the past a lot of these migrant caravans that are coming up through Mexico are like all, all black men. That That's not... Uh, very common in Latin America. They're coming from Africa and they're coming up through these migrant caravans. They're, they're going to Latin America first and then they're coming up there. So this is this is going to impact all of us in some way. And, and I think somebody pointed out something about disease. Yeah, monkeypox come from this region. When people are hungry and desperate, they're also more likely to get sick. We're seeing an increase, arguably, in infectious disease, in pandemics, and if there is widespread hunger, hunger and chaos, that will get worse. So 
couple of reasons why this is all going to impact us. Let me look at a couple of the comments and then we will move on to stories about the economy. Black Magic says, fuck cities. Black Magic, you need a garden in your back, well, in, in all of your extra time. So fair enough, you don't have a lot of extra time. Well, you have a big back backyard, you can put a garden in there, but then you don't, you don't have time for that. Black Magic, $5, thank you. Just give the government control over all of the water. There is no way this ends horrifically. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the five bucks. El Elvacara says the migrant issue will lead to some hardcore violence as food and fuel get more expensive. Our quote leaders are maliciously incompetent. Well, uh, at least we know they're not going to go to California. There won't be any food there because the state legislature. <laughs> oh, so I told Matt about the story of, of the water in California. The state legislature was going to take all the water away from the farmers. And Matt says, well, you know, the farms, the plants, they don't need water. And I said, they don't? They don't need water? He says, no, they need electrolytes. That's what plants crave. And that is what the legislature in California is like. Let's look at a couple more comments in uh, YouTube. Mike Bergman says, I better hurry and get some dark face paint. Yikes. Armed in AK. Thanks. It rejected my original posting, so I had to play with the words. I've had that happen on like Matt and Blonde show where I've had to like I think I wanted to say ass. Like my ass is getting big and it wouldn't let me write ass. <laughs> so it's just uh Mike Bourbon says they need Brondo. Yes, that is what they need. That's true. Black Magic says you can pry my water from my cold dead hands. Well, this is why I'm telling everybody, you know, I started the show off with a long monologue about my garden we're about to lose all the produce in california make sure you're starting your garden because you can't start your garden in august you can probably still start it now it's pretty late there's some plants you're not going to be able to do you're not going to at this point if you're just starting now you're not going to be able to do peas you're not going to be able to do uh, probably bell peppers because they take too long and you're gonna have to look very carefully at the seed packets and see how many days it takes for germination but uh, if you haven't started a garden I would very strongly recommend that you know what black magic people are really gonna need their fireplaces this winter because they're not gonna be able to afford food so you have a skill that's very useful in SHTF you're, you probably don't need to start a garden Alrighty, I am uh, going to, oh, incidentally, I, I told that joke to my sisters and they haven't seen the movie. So my sister just replied, no, they need water. I was like, okay, <laughs> just completely lost on her. That's all right. I, one thing that's going to make some of these economic issues worse is um, we are back, we, have, we are not out of the woods for a lot of this supply chain disruption in Cali California. California, China, same thing. Uh, in China, they just lifted their lockdowns at the very beginning of June, and now they're doing lockdowns again. They're doing them in Shanghai, they've just started, and they're threatening to do them in Beijing. This is just going to continue to make all of the supply chain disruption worse. Shanghai will lock down millions of people again over the weekend, just 10 days after lifting its grueling two-month confinement. Authorities have ordered PCR testing for all residents in 14 of the city's 16 districts. Five of the districts said residents would... That guy looks so annoyed. Not be allowed to leave their homes while the testing was carried out. The Chinese commercial hub is racing to stop a wider outbreak after discovering a handful of community cases. The latest scare triggered another rush to grocery stores and online platforms to stock up on food. Some areas had remained sealed off or quickly returned to lockdown due to infections and their close contacts. Zhang Jian is a 34-year-old estate agent. Of course I'm worried. Lockdown was just lifted on June the 1st. We're slowly recovering and returning to some semblance of normal work. The residential compound next to mine has already been under lockdown. If there is a mass testing and there is another positive case in the compound, it will have a serious impact on our lives, including our work. 
you know what though once china really just completely comes out of these lockdowns that is going to once again increase the price of gas because uh shanghai beijing when everybody's locked down and they're not driving around they're not using gas <clears throat> when they're not going to work they're not using the fuel to operate the factories so that was one of the things that happened during covid was the price of gas actually went down everywhere because everybody was stuck at home all over the world let me move this a little bit I'm not quite where i want it to be right like that okay uh, so once they are really going back to work and they supposedly were going back to work a couple of weeks ago, but once they're really back to work, that will increase the price of gas again. But you know, it's as much as we're trying to get away from dependency on China, it doesn't happen overnight. Same thing with, you know, if we were to move all of the agriculture that's currently in California, that doesn't happen overnight. So we are still, at least at the moment, dependent on China for a lot of the supply chain and them not, not going to work, staying home is continuing to make it worse. So we are, we are not out of the woods. We are, we're still very much in it. I, let's look just a comment or two and then i'm going to go over to next stories i actually had a lot of stories this time so hopefully we'll be able to get through all of them over here on entropy alkman says prc people's republic of china lockdowns for everyone except those in the re-education camps yeah i'm sure they have to go to work kyle glenn the ccp is crazy how is that investing in china in the china market going yeah i they've i don't know why they're doing this they're crazy this is just destroying the Chinese economy. I don't know what their game is. I don't know. I don't understand who benefits from this in China. Like they've, they've got to know this is foolish. So why do they keep doing it? I, I don't get what the angle is, if you will. Uh, over here back on YouTube. Turnip soup says salutations. Well, salutations to you. That's one thing I'm not growing is turnips. I just don't like them. But I do like leeks. I do like leeks. They're actually really good. The uh, last last uh, week, I showed you a video of the CEO of J.P. Morgan, Sa not Saks, <laughs> J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, Jamie Dimon, who talked about a hurricane, an economic hurricane that was coming. The president of Goldman Sachs, John Waldron, said something very similar. I don't have video of it. This is from Forward Observer. Everybody take a drink, drinking game. But this is from Forward Observer reporting this. The chief Oper operating officer and president of Goldman Sachs, John Waldron, says that, quote, this is among, if not the most, complex, dynamic environment I've ever seen in my career. We've obviously been through a lot of cycles, but the confluence of the number of shocks to the system to me is unprecedented. And I've talked about that before, is the whole economic system, the global economic system can handle a shock or two. And you may feel it, the markets may go down a little bit. Uh, you may see some evidence of an economic shock somewhere in the system. We've had several. COVID was huge. Well, the lockdowns, not really COVID. The lockdowns were huge. This uh, stuff that's going on in Ukraine, that's huge. The governments, the US government's response to everything by just printing tons and tons of money, that was huge. There have been lots and lots of shocks to the system in rapid succession. And every shock to the system makes it weaker if there's not enough time to recover before the next shock. And it has been one after the other after the other. The system at this point, the entire economic system is very, very weak and is very vulnerable to additional shocks. It may already be too far gone so that it doesn't actually need another shock. It's already on the verge of collapse and I think that it is. Uh, citing risks to the cycle of operating capital markets, Waldron says that Goldman Sachs will work to diversify and expand its asset and wealth management divisions through M&A from emerging opportunities. Waldron's statement follows JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon's statement that the economy is in a quote hurricane just up the road is quote coming our way and that we aren't sure if it's going to be a minor hurricane or Superstorm Sandy. There's been, and this is the commentary from, 
Ford Observer, there's been a sharp shift in rhetoric from top banking officials that only a few short weeks ago provided opinions that we could navigate out of our economic hardship without a recession. Between stag stagflation's emergence, recessionary warnings, inflationary pressures, uncertain action on monetary policy, and the war in Ukraine, opinions have swayed toward what could be described as inevitable for some type of negative economic event. I've looked at some of the other predictions and assessments from uh, respected people in the financial field, and there are still some out there, especially people who work for the government, insisting that everything's going to be fine. I think at that point, that opinion is on the verge of ridiculous. I think a lot of these people in these positions of authority in um, the financial field are doing you know, what I described last week. They're, they're trying to continue to paint a rosy picture because sometimes the things that they say actually make things happen. So if they say everything's going to be fine, go ahead and invest. People start investing and then there's a lot of capital investment and you see growth. Um, if they're all saying it's really bad, take your money out, everybody takes their money out and you see a recession. So their assessments, their predictions, their recommendations can actually cause things to happen. And that's why a lot of times, even when they know it's not good, they're still going to say it's good because that may actually cause a recovery. Um, but I think we're starting to see more and more of these financial experts just kind of throw up their hands and say, we can't, we can't keep lying. We, we gotta, it's not going to get better. And it doesn't matter what we say. It's not going to get better. We can't make it better just by saying it's going to get better. We're, we're beyond that point. And the more people in these kinds of positions who say this, not only the more certain it is, but I think it was already certain, but also the sooner it's going to happen because they wouldn't be saying these things until we were upon it. Until they think that it's really, really too late, they're going to keep trying to paint a rosy picture. When they stop doing that, it's, it's imminent. I think this is going to happen very, very soon. Uh, okay, let's look at a couple of the comments. 8.02. Okay, I've got to keep an eye on the time tonight. Billy says, without a crisis, the government has no purpose. This is from 1984. I don't know whether that's a direct quote, but that was part of it is in, in the book 1984, there is supposedly a war going on, but you start, you know, as the book goes on, you start to wonder whether there's really a war going on or is the government just saying that so that they can create an emergency that will uh, increase their power over the people. It's an excuse to take away their freedoms. Darren says, you know why they're doing it, Laurel? Control. To gain control, you need a crisis. To keep control, you need a disarmed population. I'll get to that in a bit. Reference the current legislation making its way through Congress. I will get to that, I promise. Um, maybe I should continue on. I don't, I don't want to jump ahead because i got a bunch of other things that I want to do in between here and there. So let's go on to the next story, which is, this is all about um, fuel. And there was an explosion at a liquid natural gas processing and export facility in Texas. A very big explosion that has now caused shortages or caused prices to increase significantly in Europe for liquid natural gas. And natural gas prices are soaring That's the explosion. in Europe after this happened. Freeport, LA. I'm going to go back over that. This is the only video I could find showing the actual explosion. And natural gas prices are soaring in Europe after this happened. Freeport LNG is one of the largest U.S. export plants for liquefied natural gas. It suffered an explosion at its Texas Gulf Coast facility. The plant accounts for about 20 percent of the company's processing. It's reported it will remain closed for at least three weeks. Traders are concerned lost U.S. shipments will add stress to the market already dealing with a cut in Russian supplies. So that was very significant for liquid natural gas exports. And I'm less concerned about the United States and more concerned about Europe. We actually have enough for ourselves, even without that. But uh, that was for exports. There is an investigation currently underway as to what caused that explosion. But it seems a little suspicious 
Here, Europe is in the middle of a liquid natural gas crisis, and then one of the plants in Texas just explodes. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that one, but that that's pretty suspicious. And we'll, we'll see what happens with that. The prices in Europe, because of this, they soared by 40% after the fire. I, I'm going to make this bigger, but you know what? I think I, this is one thing I don't like already about this, um, what do you call it? The Streamlabs OBS is I'm having more trouble expanding this so I can get a better look at it. Okay. Natural gas prices surged across Europe on Thursday after a fire broke out at a key U.S. export hub, putting further pressure on already tight global supply. You know, and this harkens back to all of these fires and other accidents at food processing plants. It just seems awfully coincidental. And over the past several weeks, even a couple of months, I've been showing you fires and explosions at other oil facilities. So it just, you know, I don't know whether it's always like this and we just never noticed or it wasn't as important because we weren't in the middle of a crisis in Europe. But right now it's kind of looking unusual. It's kind of looking unusual and I wonder I wonder how much is this of this is uh, potentially sabotage. The Freeport, lag it up in my hair up, I'm hot. The Freeport liquefied natural gas export facility in Quintana, Texas will remain closed for at least three weeks after Wednesday's explosion, a company spokesman said. The terminal accounts for nearly a fifth of all U.S. overseas gas shipments. So not just a fifth of theirs, a fifth of ours. I thought it was a fifth of that company's overseas gas shipments. But according to this article, it's a fifth of all U.S. overseas gas shipments. That's huge. The terminal accounts for nearly a fifth of all U.S. overseas gas shipments. According to Bloomberg, the U.S. supplies almost half of Europe's liquid natural gas. Wow. That, this is a very, very big deal for Europe. It's going to be closed for three weeks. UK natural gas futures surged around 33% to 172 pence per therm after the outage, while benchmark Dutch gas prices rose just under 12% to 88 euros per megawatt hour. Meanwhile, US Henry Hub gas futures fell just under 5%. So our futures fell because we're not going to be making as much money, there's not as much to sell. But the prices of buying it in Europe went way up. I... Oh, this is why. I see. The R prices went down because that was an export facility. So we're actually going to have more because we can't export it. It has to go through that facility to export it. So there's a glut locally in the U.S. This is more liquid natural gas for us because we can't export it. So the price actually fell in the U.S. That's interesting. It went up in Europe and fell in the U.S. because we can't send it. European gas benchmarks surged to all-time highs after Russia's invasions of Ukraine and continue to be highly volatile. UK and Dutch prices are up 143% and 200% respectively over the past year. So that's really interesting. Cactus Foot says the reason it happened is because of brain fog of vaccinated workers. But all of these things, you know, when everything is already on the edge, because of all these shocks to the system and now everything is much more vulnerable these little shocks that normally would be nothing become significant in the aggregate they become significant in light of everything else that's happened so and my hair doesn't look good like this but i'm hot so i'll leave it uh reason it says sounds like an argument for tariffs for me yeah well i sort of think you know and i've said that i think that if you're having a shortage of something in your country that you're going to have to slow down or stop the exports. Uh, Black Magic, $5. Thank you. Step one, subvert, subvert the people's glorious history. Step two, teach their children to hate themselves. Step three, profit. You know what you're doing. You should run for office. You know exactly how it's done. Kyle Glenn says it's a lot of deferred maintenance. And that was the theory that I, I presented last week. It wasn't my theory, but it was from Ford Observer that some of the things that are happening at these plants are because of deferred maintenance. And that's possible. Maybe during COVID, that's a possibility. Um, it just seems really, really 
suspicious. So we'll see what happens with the investigation. Um, this past week, there was an arrest. I don't know how to make this transition, so I'm just going to jump right into it. There was an arrest of one of the GOP frontrunners. Well, the GOP frontrunner, the Republican frontrunner for governor in Michigan, here in Michigan. This, uh, this guy is going up against, his name is Ryan Kelly, sounds very, very Irish. He's going up against Governor Whitman who is the current, is it Whitman or Whitmer? Whitmer, who is the incumbent. And this guy here, dog barking, this guy has the best chance of beating her. And um, he just got arrested. And he was arrested by the FBI over a misdemeanor. Now, how often does the FBI get involved in misdemeanors? And it's mostly like misdemeanor trespassing and they raided his house. This is because of January 6th. So he was present at January 6th. He didn't even go in the building. They're saying he was encouraging people to go in. It's a demonstration, not an insurrection. And they're arresting the FBI. So this, I think, is very clear evidence that the FBI has become the hitmen for the Democratic Party. And they are working, they're not working for the people of the U.S., they're not working for the U.S. government, they're working for the Democratic Party to eliminate the political opponent of the governor of Michigan. This is clearly, clearly, I mean, we already knew that, but this is, this to me is egregious when they are arresting the political opponent for a governor, they're arresting their political enemies for misdemeanors, for little stuff. This is just, this is disturbing. Special agents raiding Republic. Now, Ryan Kelly's attorney sent me a message moments ago stating that they will fight the charges. He will continue his campaign for governor in Michigan, and he is heading home with his family. Now, we have been unable to reach an attorney representing Walsh Kaufman. Yeah, I hope he wins. And hopefully this is going to cause people to vote for him. Hopefully it will have the opposite of their intended uh, effect. Super Chat says there's buffering. Let me take a look at um, the YouTube thingy here. Um, it looks okay to... Oh, that's not YouTube. That's uh, Entropy. It looks okay to me at the moment. Uh, Adam says it was buffering for him as well. Okay. Uh, I will keep an, uh, an eye on that. Mark Mike Bourbon says dropping frames? Question mark. I don't know. I... Uh, Thanks for letting me know it was buffering. I'll keep an eye on that. But, um, yeah, so they're just, I think this is a, I mean, we already knew they were doing this, that they're weaponizing the FBI and this whole January 6th committee to just go after political opponents. And I mentioned that last week when they went after Peter Navarro. But doing this to a candidate for governor, our our. It's further evidence that our government has just completely lost its way. Uh, and maybe it lost its way a long time ago and we just didn't realize it, but they're, they're being really obvious now, which is either a sign of uh, they're not afraid of anybody else at this point. They're so powerful that they're not afraid to be obvious or they're desperate and it's more important to uh, attain the goal at hand than to hide what they're doing. So I'm hoping it's the latter. There's a kid down the street who has a little motorcycle. It's like an electric, it might be a gas one, but he's like eight years old and he goes around on a little motorcycle. So if that's too loud, <laughs> I'll close the window, but hopefully I won't, I won't have to do that because it's hot. Just getting worse and worse. Um, Jeff's Freedom Garage says, Laurel Whitmer is not getting in if I have to be Matt's spotter as we vote from the rooftops defensively, Susan. Okay. Maybe I shouldn't have read that one out loud. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go over here to Entropy. Um, yeah, Alan Aries, FBI has taken over from the KKK. The FBI is the Stasi, according to Kyle Glenn. I agree. They've just become the the... They're the brown shirts. They're the ones doing the dirty work for the Democratic Party. That's what the FBI is now. They've lost all respect. The January 6th committee, they just had some primetime hearings on, I think, Friday night. So I looked at 
there were some videos put out by the mainstream media, little clips on YouTube for the highlights because I didn't watch that whole freaking thing. I worked really hard on Friday and I was tired. Uh, no, actually Friday. Anyway, um, so I looked at these highlight reels and it, there was nothing. There just it was stuff that has already been made public. There's this chick that you can see in this picture right here. She's a police officer and she talked about all this carnage and she was slipping on people's blood. And I'm, you know, I watched that little clip of her and I'm like, does she know we saw the footage? Like we've seen lots and lots of footage of what happened on January 6th. And her description of what happened is ridiculous in light of what we have seen with our own eyes. So it was hyperbole. It was ridiculous for the things that she was saying. So I don't know who she thinks they're fooling. And there were some grandstanding by politicians talking about it being an insurrection and all this other stuff. And it was, there was nothing. There was nothing useful in this hearing. They had Trump's daughter and son-in-law saying that they believe the results of the election. Okay, so they turned their back on their father. They had Bill Barr saying he didn't want to uh, continue fighting the election results and he kind of believed the results of the election. Okay, but... You know, none of that surprises us. We kind of already knew that. We kind of already knew that not everybody in Trump's camp agreed with um, with the possibility that the election results were fortified. So there was nothing. There was nothing from these hearings on uh, Friday. Um, you don't need to go and watch them because there's nothing. There's going to be more of these and they're primetime hearings. So I know that hearings have been going on for a while, but they, these are the primetime hearings that apparently they thought would impress the voters. I don't know. Uh, the rest of the primetime hearings are going to be on Monday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday. Oh, Thursday afternoon. It looks well, These aren't primetime. So I guess that was the only one that's primetime because I thought this was a list of all the ones. But Monday, it's going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning. Wednesday, it's 10 in the morning. And then on Thursday, it's 1 in the afternoon, which is totally not primetime. I guess that was the only primetime one. All right. Well, they are, it's a big nothing burger. There's nothing there, but we already knew that. So their hearings, there's nothing there. Whereas on our side, there's a little more uh, items of interest. I think the whole January 6th committee stuff is losing a lot of voters. I think the voters care about inflation. I, I think even voters who care about, like who think, who, who believe this story that January 6th was an insurrection. I think even those people are more concerned about inflation. So the Democrats are going to lose. They've lost the plot. Uh, Mark M says, I'm going to piss on you and tell you it's raining. Yep. Sonny Jim says, Trump is coming back and he'll be a puppet. Unfortunately, I think Trump is going to be president again. Uh, I think Trump served an important purpose when he was elected last time. He came in, uh, as somebody said, we hired him to break stuff, not to fix stuff. And he came in and he broke stuff. And I think that was a really important thing for him to do. But that's done. And, and there's other things that need to be done where I don't think Trump is the right guy. I would rather see DeSantis or someone more radical than DeSantis. Um, but I don't think Trump is the right guy at this point. But I do think that if he runs, he'll win. So. I won't vote for him in the primaries, but if he is the winner of the Republican primaries, then I will vote for him in the generals. So we shall see. January 6th hearing. All right. So the January 6th hearings were a nothing burger, although the people who are currently in jail over January 6th, that's not nothing. But just as the FBI, it has become the political, the, the hitmen for the Democratic Party, we are also seeing law enforcement be weaponized and co-opted into going after any kind of patriots. In Idaho, there was a counter protest that, well, there was a rally planned for pride, for gay pride, and there were, uh, there was a protest planned by Patriot Front 
and knowing how Antifa behaves, they were prepared. They were getting prepared to face any resistance that might be thrown at them. They were prepared to defend themselves. And um, the police came and arrest, arrested them all for planning a riot. They had not done anything. All the weapons that they have, and they even say this, the police even say this in this report that you're about to watch, all of the weapons that were in their possession were legally possessed. So they're allowed to assemble, they're allowed to protest, they're allowed to talk amongst themselves, they're allowed to bring these weapons, but somehow they got arrested. Supposedly for planning a riot, that's going to be hard to prove. 31 men arrested in Cordon Lane this afternoon associated with the known white supremacist group. Officers found members of the group known as Patriot Front packed into the back of a U-Haul after they received a tip from someone seeing the group loading into the truck in a hotel parking lot. Officers stopped the U-Haul near a Pride event. According to our news partners KXLY in Spokane, Coeur d'Alene police had stepped up presence in the area of the Pride event. Coeur d'Alene, by the way, that is where Blonde lives. Those of you who watch the Matt and Blonde show, that, that is indeed where Blonde lives. So I will be watching her show tonight, the, their show tonight, because to, she's sure to talk about this. It's in the town where she resides. Let's go back a little. Up ...presence in the area of the Pride event due to concerns of possible armed protesters. We did know about some of the threats that were happening online, and yes, there were people walking around the event with long guns and handguns and bear spray and all kinds of things like that. Uh, not that's illegal in Idaho. It's uh, only to the point when they start using it that we grow really concerned. But they didn't use it. Police say they found riot gear, a smoke grenade, shin guards, and shields, along with plans for riots in several areas of downtown, not just at that park. All 31 men have been charged with conspiracy to riot. This is ridiculous. In my opinion, I would gladly arrest 31 individuals who are coming to riot in our city for a misdemeanor, rather than have them participate in some sort of seriously disruptive event, which is exactly what they were planning. Police say the men currently detained came from at least 11 states, including Idaho. Additional charges could be filed. All 31 are expected to be arraigned Monday morning. They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. They, all the weapons they possess, they were illegally allowed to possess. They have a right, they have freedom of assembly. They had the right to assemble. They have the right to protest. I just want you to look at how these, uh, look at the gear they're wearing. It looks like they're from some sci-fi movie, like Stormtroopers or Demolition Man or something. That is some impressive riot gear that the uh, police are wearing. So this is, I, I, we can expect more of this. They're just going to start arresting people when, when you haven't even done anything. Not only there are they arresting the, the January 6th protesters for being on public property, how can you trespass on the front yard of the Capitol. It was public property. So they're arresting people to, for doing things that are perfectly legal. And these guys, they didn't do anything and they got arrested. So be super careful out there. They're just, they're just arresting us on the slightest thing or nothing. If you haven't done anything wrong, they'll make something up. That's what happened to these guys. They, had, they didn't do anything. Larry Ropshaw says, uh, Transformers. <laughs> so those of you who are listening to this and not watching it, I'm not making fun of what the Patriots were wearing. I'm making fun of what the Sheriff's Office, I, I mean, it, it might work really well, but their gear, uh, it just looks very, very futuristic. Uh, over here on Entropy, Kyle Glenn says they didn't remove the masks. Interesting. Yeah, when they were arresting a lot of these guys, uh, some of them, they had face masks on and it, their the masks weren't removed. Alkman says, Laurel, dudes in the weird armor are in riot gear. They are from the jail. Yeah. I know. I was just uh, admiring how, how, uh, <laughs> how interesting it looked. Uh, Elva Caro says, Vince James lives in Coeur d'Alene. Oh, I did not know that. Uh, he used to live in Los Angeles. So I guess he moved. Probably a good move. Kyle Glenn says, more of that multi-ethnic white supremacy. Yep. Um, <laughs> Black Panther says, hopefully bon Blonde goes full Mommy Waffen tonight. All right, I got, oh, Fiery Waco, if you can't tell the difference between the military and the police, then they're both the military. Uh, I like that. And that is a good quote that I will keep in mind for the future. Speaking of, they will arrest you for anything. 
Uh, I know a lot of you were talking about this before I started the show, and this is there is a tentative agreement in the U.S. Senate to pass a federal law. The law itself isn't going to be a red flag law, but it's going to open the door for a lot of red flag laws on the state level, is my understanding of um, how they're describing this agreement. The Senate group agrees on a broad outline of a new gun law after the Uvalde massacre. A bipartisan group of senators on Sunday announced, and that would be today, on Sunday announced an agreement that had been reached, though in principle only, a new legislation meant to address the country's ongoing gun violence, including the recent Uvalde, Texas elementary school shooting. The deal in the work works for weeks, has the support of at least 10 Republicans in the Senate, which is the number needed to avoid a filibuster. If passed, the proposal would be the first major gun law to make it through Congress in years. Among other things, the agreement would provide funding for mental health, including behavioral health centers, and incentives for the so-called red flag laws to remove firearms from people who are in danger to themselves or others, increase money for school safety, and strengthen the federal background check system as it relates to convicted domestic violence abusers or those with restraining orders. Let me say just a little bit about restraining orders. I don't know how it is in other countries, but in the U.S., for restraining orders, generally, it's going to vary by state, but generally, the person requesting the restraining order doesn't have to prove shit. The person requesting the restraining order only has to allege a credible fear of violence from this person. They don't have to prove anything. You don't get a restraining order from beyond a reasonable doubt that you've proven in front of a jury. Restraining orders are very easy to get. So they are talking about uh, strengthening federal background so you can't get a gun if there's a restraining order against you and restraining orders are super easy to get, just FYI. Potential gun owners under 21 would also be subject to an investigative period review to review juvenile and mental health records, including, they're looking over mental, mental health records are supposed to be private. They're supposed to be covered by the, uh, by HIPAA. They're private, but there's all of these laws that are making that gone and people are just aren't gonna go get mental health assistance. They're just not going to say anything to the site. They're not going to agree to go to a psychologist. This is going to make it worse because people will stop seeking mental health assistance. They'll stop seeking mental health care because the records aren't private. They're too easy to get. They're too easy for the police to get. They're too easy for the government to get. Uh, 20 senators released a statement confirming the deal, saying in part, today we are announcing a common sense bipartisan proposal to protect America's children, keep our schools safe, and reduce the threat of violence across the country. Families are scared, and it is our duty to come together and get something done that will help restore their sense of safety and security in their communities. They are trying to disarm um, people in the middle of uh, government overreach. Now they're trying to, well, they've always been trying to disarm the people, but this would be the worst time for the disarmament to happen. It would just open the door for the government to be that much more overreaching. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, and for a lot of these laws, you know, even laws that are, quote, common sense and, and laws you might generally agree with, they're also being enforced unevenly. It, you look at everything that happened uh, to the January 6th demonstrators and you look at everybody for the summer of love who was released. So a, a lot of laws are being enforced unevenly and the same thing will happen with gun laws is they will be enforced against patriots and not enforced against Antifa. And that's exactly what will happen. Rick Bourne says that is right. You can get a restraining order very easily and women lie about them to screw men over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I've read, you know, I, I've had clients who've, I do immigration, but I've read clients who've had restraining orders because it, it comes into play in the immigration case. And I always point out when I'm writing stuff for the government for their immigration case, I'm like, you don't have to prove anything to get a restraining order. And it should not be used against my client that they had a restraining order for get, to get it. Um, and there was even one client that I had where the judge actually denied the restraining order because and the, in the 
statement when the judge denied the restraining order, he said to this woman, he says, you haven't even alleged anything. You, you just say you don't want him to call you. Well, that's not allegations of violence. <laughs> so the judge actually denied the restraining order and he said, you haven't alleged anything. And he said, all you have to do is allege something and you didn't. You didn't. Um, Rick Bourne, restraining orders are abused in divorce filings. Oh, always. All the time. Yes. There's restraining orders. And the idea was originally, <clears throat> you know, what harm is there in just granting the restraining order? All the restraining order says is you can't go near her. You know, what's the harm in granting it? Well, the harm is that it's used against the men in all kinds of situations that they had a restraining order against them because there's this presumption that people don't understand what they are and they presume that there was some sort of trial and they were found guilty of something. No, no, it's too easy to get. All right, let's keep going. <clears throat> Kavanaugh, somebody asked, is she Jewish? Are you talking about me? No, I am not. I am English and Scottish. It's the nose, I know. No, I have 0% Jewish in me. Uh, <clears throat> Kavanaugh. So there was a credible th threat against Kavanaugh. There's a guy who has been arrested with attempted murder. He didn't actually get close to Kavanaugh, but he was coming to kill him. And this is somebody who was mentally unstable, or so the story goes. But this seems to be the kind of person that the far left is targeting with a lot of their rhetoric. The far left has published the street addresses of a lot of these Supreme Court nominee or uh, Supreme Court justices. And they've encouraged people who perhaps have a terminal illness who are perhaps suicidal that they might want to step forward for women's rights is how their uh, argument goes um, because of the whole Roe versus Wade situation. And this is exactly the kind of person that they are targeting with their rhetoric is somebody who is a little unstable, a little bit suicidal. So for the, the far left, I think cannot excuse themselves from responsibility for this when this is exact and say that this guy's crazy. He's not our responsibility when that's exactly the kind of person that they're trying to reach with a lot of the things that they've been saying. Man arrested near Brett Kavanaugh's home charged with attempted murder. FBI affidavit, affidavit says Nicholas Rosk traveled from California to kill a specific United States Supreme Court justice. A man has been charged with attempted murder after he was arrested near the home of Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court justice on Wednesday. <clears throat> Nicholas Rosk, 26, was armed with a tactical knife, a Glock 17 pistol, pepper spray, zip ties, and a hammer, the FBI said. Rosk told law enforcement he was upset about a leaked draft opinion that showed the court had provisionally overturned, uh, voted to overturn Roe versus Wade, the landmark 1973 ruling that established the right to abortion. Rosk from Simi Valley, California, said he traveled to Maryland, quote, to kill a specific Supreme Court justice, according to an affidavit from an FBI agent. He was arrested early on Wednesday morning in Montgomery County, Maryland, after he called the County Emergency Communications Center. Rosk informed the call taker that he was having suicidal thoughts and had a firearm in his suitcase. <laughs> Fiery Waker says, Laurel is mixed race, English and Scottish. Yep. So uh, this guy has been arrested and he was near Kavanaugh's house. I don't know how near. It doesn't really describe how far away. So I don't know whether he was like two doors down or does near mean like 10 miles away? I don't know. <clears throat> he did turn himself in, but expect to see more of that. Expect to see more of it. Rick Bourne says, yes, the leak against the USSC to reverse U.S. Supreme Court to reverse Roe versus Wade is in hope of murder of a USSC justice. Nothing less. I, all right, um, quickly, I'm going to go over, over here to Entropy. Um, Altman says, had this guy succeeded, Br I think you mean Brandon would get to appoint a new justice. Yeah, that's true. And that's one of the things the left has been saying is that people should do something because if one of the Supreme Court just justices dies, then uh, Biden gets to support to nominate someone new, appoint someone new. Altman says Schumer should be charged with incitement by Schumer's own standards. Yep. 
Oakman says, Laurel, he got dropped off by cab almost in front of the house. Wow. So he was right there. Damn. Kyle Glenn says that dude glows white. I don't know about that. Uh, why would an FBI agent... I mean, he's basically... It's a, it's a lefty. So why would the FBI... It just doesn't fit what the FBI has been doing. So, I, you know, I don't know about that one. Uh, all right, next story, because I am actually running out of time. I only have a little bit of time left, and I got a couple more stories, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, Iran is removing all of the cameras from their nuclear facilities because the whole nuclear deal that was put together under the Obama administration has fallen apart. Okay, you know, I, Trump backed out of it, but part of the deal was that they would have cameras on their nuclear facilities. They've been removing those. Um, Iran told the, okay, let me read the whole thing. IAEA warns of fatal blow to nuclear deal as Iran moves cameras. Iran on Thursday dealt a near fatal blow to chances of reviving, reviving the 2015 nu Iran nuclear deal as it began removing essentially all the International Atomic Energy Agency monitoring equipment installed under the deal. Iran had warned of retaliation if the IAEA's 35-nation Board of Governors passed a re resolution drafted by the United States, France, Britain, and Germany criticizing Tehran for its continued failure to explain uranium traces found at undeclared sites. The resolution was passed by a crushing majority late on Wednesday. Iran told the agency overnight it planned to remove equipment including 27 IAEA cameras as of Thursday, which is, quote, basically all of the extra monitoring equipment installed under the 2015 deal going beyond Iran's core obligations to the agency. That leaves a window of opportunity of three or four weeks to restore at least some of the monitoring that is being scrapped, or the IAEA will lose the ability to piece together Iran's most important nuclear activities. So I am of two minds of this. Um, one thought that I have is Iran is a sovereign nation. They can do what they want. And the other thought that I have is if other countries don't like what Iran is doing, they can invade. Uh, I'm not of this whole thought of invasion is inherently evil or wrong. Uh, I think I'm a, just a lot more pragmatic uh, when we're talking about one nation invading another. And um, if Iran is thinking, I have the right to do this and screw them, well, yeah. Um, but I also think the other countries have, have the right to then go and invade Iran if they want to and shut down all the nuclear facilities. Um, I, I think countries aren't people and you don't have the protection of a constitution. You, I think you can get invaded at any time. Billy Black says Israel will bomb them. I think that's a possibility. So what does this mean for, um, Rick Bourne says Iran's neighbors cannot invade. It doesn't have to be their neighbors. It can be someone. So I, I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't think invasion is inherently immoral and then countries invade each other what you do there i mean on an individual basis one person can do something immoral to another person billy blocks three dollars do you have any faith the midterms will wipe out the dems or is usa committing suicide and bringing down the west with it um I don't, I, I think, um, I think people will vote to wipe out the Dems in the midterms. And I think at that point, if that's not what happens, then um, I think we should be very suspicious of the voting system at that point. I think that there's reason to be suspicious right now. And I think the midterms, if the Democrats aren't wiped out, then that should be a, an aha moment. <laughs> That's what I think. So we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I think it's possible that the Dems are going to say, um, if we win this election, it's going to be too obvious. They, they might do that. They might go, no, the voting is going to be too strong in a certain way. So we basically have to lose or it's going to be too obvious. Or they might say, you know, I, I've mentioned that they, 
they've been more obvious lately and it's possibly because they're desperate and if they're that desperate they may win but that should tell us a lot so that's my answer to that one all right just a little bit more this is from okay i think i'm okay on time i'm probably going to end at 8 45 um because there's things i want to do before the matt and blonde show but let's see what i say that now but i may end up i may end up ending on time anyway all right uh, let's look over here at um this is from forward observer and okay it's about Russia. Now I've talked a lot before about the possibility of a cyber attack from Russia and it, I'm sure a lot of you noticed that hasn't happened. So what's going on? Why do we not have a big cyber attack from Russia? Well, I, they might be holding back. They might be afraid that it's going to escalate the conflict directly with the United States and the West and they've been not wanting to take that step. But there have been cyber attacks against them that are getting underreported in the mainstream media and the Western media. And they're starting to think, you know, we might need to do it. Uh, Russia's foreign ministry warned of a direct military clash caused by ongoing cyber disruptions to government infrastructure. This is cyber attacks against them. Rest assured, Russia will not leave aggressive actions unanswered, he said. All our steps will be measured, targeted, in accordance with our legislation and international law. He added that the U.S. is deliberately lowering the threshold for the combat use of cyber attacks. A analysis from Ford Observer, Russian officials are increasing red line statements on Western involvement in Ukraine. Russia maintains substantial cyber capabilities, but hasn't fully unleashed its operatives on U.S. networks, likely out of fear of reprisal. State-backed but unofficial entities may carry out the Kremlin cyber plans for deniability. Likely targets remain U.S. communications networks, utilities, all government systems, private businesses, and GPS. Make sure you have paper maps. It is still a threat, and I think that the threat is increasing. It hasn't happened. Uh, I think there's a temptation to let your guard down when you're afraid something's going to happen, and then it doesn't happen, doesn't happen, doesn't happen. And you start the, the sort of alarm, you get used to it, and you start thinking it's less of a threat because it hasn't happened yet. It is still a major, major threat. They are increasing their rhetoric regarding the possibility of cyber attack because they are apparently under a lot of cyber attack and they're, they're thinking they're going to retaliate at some point. Madara says, I don't think nukes are real. They're probably just propaganda being used to intimidate populations interfering more, war more than they should. And in this way, they control the possibility and context of war. I think nukes are real. I think news are real, but that, that's an interesting thought. Easy infidel, I'm not counting on anything is changing in November. Most likely things will get worse. Rusna says, I don't know if it's desperation. Yeah, as I said, the other the other possibility is they've got so much power, they don't feel the need to hide it in name anymore. And they're just doing what they're doing right out in the open. So I think it's one or the other. Either way, they're getting a lot more obvious. They're They're not trying to hide it the way that they used to. Oh, it says all forms of conflict can escalate. Yep. Kyle Glenn, peace will come back when freedom is no longer a priority. Uh, freedom, yeah. Um, if it's between peace and freedom, I want freedom. Yeah, I realize I say that now. I, I've said this over and over and over. I don't want war. I don't want war, but I don't want oppression. And I don't think the choices in front of me are war versus peace. I don't think those are the options. I think the options are war versus oppression. Those are not good options. Yeah, I've never been through war. I've never been through oppression. It's We're heading in that direction. We're going to have to pick one. Um, all right. And the last story that I've got is an update to the whole baby formula thing, which is basically, let me jump down here to some of these, look at that picture of the baby. Isn't that cute? The Abbott fa Baby Family Factory, it is a formula factory. <laughs> it's not a baby family factory. The Abbott Baby Formula Factory 
<laughs> Mommy, where do BBs come from? They come from a factory in Michigan. The Abbott BB Formula Factory in Sturgis, Michi Michigan has reopened a move that could ease the nationwide BB formula. I almost said it again, BB formula shortage. <laughs> Sorry. BBs are made in Sturgis. Um, down here it says, uh, Abbott said in an, in, in, in oh, I'm getting tired. Abbott said in an invest, one more try. Abbott said an investigation found no evidence to link the formulas to the infant illnesses, though bacteria was found in parts of the factory that didn't have contact with formula. I have looked and looked and looked, and the FDA, FDA has not denied this. They haven't said, the FDA has not come out and said, yeah, we suspected that that formula is, there's a couple of babies that died. We suspected that it was that baby formula, but we can't, we haven't found any evidence really linking it. The FDA has not come out and admitted that to my knowledge. But Abbott, the factory, has said that there was an investigation, I presume they mean by the FDA, and that they were not able to find out, find any indication that the bacteria was getting into the formula. That there was, they couldn't find any anything in the factory where it was getting tainted. I think the FDA just really screwed up. I think they shouldn't have closed down the factory uh, because it caused such a big shortage, but they also, I think, shouldn't have closed it down at all because it might not be the factory that was getting the, the bacteria to these infants. They may have been infected in some other way that had nothing to do with the formula. I think it was all just a big ass mistake, a massive colossal mistake. There's a lot of babies that went hungry, a lot of them that went malnourished because the FDA, I think, just really, really screwed up on this one. Uh, Rick Bourne says babies died, didn't they? What WTF? It, two babies died. I think it was just, I think it was two. And I don't want to minimize the death of those two infants, but it hasn't been proven that it was that factory in Michigan that caused it. And even if it was, there was a lot of harm done by them closing down that factory and doing that recall. And they had no plan for how to get all of that food over to the U.S. Uh, Super Soda Jerk says, Laurel, don't worry, you will own nothing and be happy. <laughs> I have at my in parts of my life owned nothing and I was not happy. So I've already been through that. Vic Bourne says, why it's it so difficult to make baby formula? Well, what the fuck, seriously? Uh, it's because there's so many FDA regulations. It's it's really hard to do because they, they're, they're so heavily regulated. Madara says, that's my opinion. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but that's too bad. In my opinion, nuclear weapons are just propaganda. The world cabal is using to maintain control to the greatest extent possible. We're, we're going to have to disagree, agree to disagree on that one. Um, I have never seen a nuclear weapon explode with my own eyes. I don't think I would survive that if I did. So I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Alkman says, baby family factory where babies make babies. Um, yeah. And Sturgis Cranes deliver babies. Uh, all right. I think that is it. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. And I am sweating. I'm really hot. I'm hoping I can talk my boyfriend into a little air conditioning. Be there tonight. With, it might be a little cooler tonight. I think it might get down to the 60s. But... Definitely on Wednesday when it's supposed to be 99 in the day and 79 at night, I'm going to need some air conditioning. So I will see you guys. Um, I think this went pretty well. This was my first attempt at using the uh, Streamlabs OBS and everything I think worked really well, especially in comparison to the Restream disasters. So I'm pretty happy about that. I will be using it again next week. And until then, I'm going to show you some pictures of my garden from last week. And the pictures you're about to see are only things that we germinated from seeds. So it, Matt says, <laughs> no AC for you. Come on, I need it. It's going to be 99 Wednesday. Anyway, so I will see you at the Matt and Blonde show. And if I don't see you then, then I will see you at my show next week. Have a good night. Good stream, guys.